Good evening and welcome. I'm Karen Elam, director of the Levine Center to End Hate at the Jewish Federation of Greater Rochester. Our mission is to unite the Greater Rochester community in overcoming hate through education, dialogue, and positive action. Thank you for joining us for Asian Matters, Standing with Rochester's Asian American Communities, a three-part series developed by the Levine Center to End Hate in partnership with Monroe Community College's Department of Global Education and International Services. We began planning this program several weeks ago amid reports of increasing attacks on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders around the country that have numbered nearly 4,000 since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, reaching an inconceivable level of violence with the slayings of six Asian women in Atlanta last month. While we are encouraged to see elected officials, businesses, celebrities, members of the sports community and others speaking out against the violence and taking action to address these hate crimes, each of us can also play a role by educating ourselves. That is the intent of our series. By centering the voices of local Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, we hope to introduce you to people and ideas that you may not be familiar with. In tonight's program, three Asian Americans from different sectors of Greater Rochester come together to talk about common misperceptions of members of the AAPI community and the ne negative effect they have. Representing perspectives from Korean, Laotian, and Indian cultural backgrounds, Hannah P.K., Smirti Jacob, and Frank Kilfetlatsi will share personal stories to clearly illuminate that no group is monolithic. And now let me introduce you to the moderator for today's program, Samiha Islam. Samiha is a member of the Levine Center's steering committee and a presidential scholar studying political science at the State University of New York at Buffalo. In 2018, she organized the From Strangers to Neighbors Festival, a project highlighting the values that refugees and immigrants bring to American society and culture. She's a former intern at the MK Gandhi Institute for Nonviolence and has been featured in the Rochester Museum and Science Center's Changemakers, Rochester Women Who Changed the World. Samiha. Thank you, Karen. For tonight's program, we'll begin with a brief presentation from each presenter, followed by a moderated Q&A session. Please put all of your questions in the Q&A box during the talk, and we will try to get to as many as possible during the event. And now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's panelists. Hannah PK is a 2019 International Blues Challenge semifinalist. A solid panelist, soulful vocalist, and vibrant performer, Hannah combines a wide variety of the blues and swing, old school folk, and boogie woogie with her own contemporary real realness. Whether performing storytelling originals, breathing new life into songs that may be a hundred years old, or anything in between. Our second panelist is Smirti Jacob, a co-founder and managing editor of the Rochester Beacon, which is a digital nonprofit publication and community forum in Rochester. An award-winning reporter and editor, Smirti worked at the Rochester Business Journal for nearly 16 years. She now owns Bold Letter Marketing, a content marketing business working with national clients like Howlett Packard, Sitecore, CareStream Health, and is an adjunct professor in the Department of English at St. John Fisher College. And our third panelist is Frank Kopilatsi, a Laotian American and Monroe County legislator born and raised in the 28th Legis Legislative District in Northwest Rochester. A, project, a product of, public school, of the public school system, Frank attended Elementary School 30, Wilson Magnet High School, Monroe Community College, and finished his bachelor's at SUNY Brockport. Through all his successes, he has remained a proud resident of Northwest Rochester because of his love and commitment to the community that shaped him. With that being said, Smirti, we'll start with you. Thank you, Samhia. I uh, am Smirti. Uh, I'm an Indian American. I was born in India, daughter of educators. And my story is unusual in that I grew up with a certain exposure to the West. My parents are both Fulbright scholars and we had students visiting the campus where my father was president uh, from the US and Europe. 
and we spoke English at home. I learned in English, I thought in English. And like most parents, my parents wanted me to have a stable professional career and they nudged me towards the sciences. I started in, in college and got my bachelor's in chemistry, moving on to graduate school where I learned biochemistry. And then I found myself as a, at a pharmaceutical company as a research chemist. I worked uh, on diagnostic kits, uh, helped design kits to diagnose blood glucose levels, cholesterol, HIV, pregnancy. And after doing about three years of that, I decided I didn't want to do it anymore. And I um, quit uh, on a whim that I could write. I, I wanted to write and I thought I could do it. So I moved from New Delhi, where the company was based, to Mumbai, uh, to a, which is in the west of India, and um, started out sort of trying whether copywriting was my thing. Uh, I thought maybe I could write copy for ads, but I found that too restrictive. And I ended up convincing an editor at a national business magazine to give me a try. It took a few meetings, but he finally gave in and I worked there for about a year before coming to the United States. Um, I came here to study journalism, to get another master's degree. And before I graduated, I came to Rochester, New York, where another editor took a chance on me and hired me at the Rochester Business Journal, where I worked as a reporter and then as an editor and Following that, worked at a startup, and then we got together to form the Rochester Beacon. Assimilating in the States, uh, I thought it, would, it was going to be really easy. Uh, I knew the language. Uh, how hard could it be? And I'm not a self-conscious person, but I found myself being conscious of the way I spoke because people would identify my accent as cute, or I would be conscious of the things I chose at a meal, if we went out to eat, I would find that if I chose vegetarian items, uh, I would be asked about my vegetarian history or, um, you know, various things like that. I don't fault people for curiosity. Everybody wants to learn. Everybody wants to know about other nations. I absolutely get that. But when you're a reporter and I'm trying to get a news story done, Almost every interview would start with my name and then it would go on to my heritage. It would go on to how I came to be in this country, how long I planned to stay here. And then finally, I would navigate through that to get to the task at hand. And of course, I became skilled at it. Um, I learned ways to sort of move conversations around, um, get to that point quicker. Uh, but in the last couple of years, I find myself going back to that and asking myself, was it curiosity or was it othering? Was it playful racism or uh, with my uh, background or was it just racism? Why was I, was I, was it intentional making me feel different? I can't help but think about that. Um, and so today I just want to say, to every person who felt, has felt different, still feels different, that I'm with them and I stand with them. Just because I've learned to navigate doesn't mean I've forgotten. I know what it's like and uh, I want you to know I'm with you. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Hannah. Um, here you go, Hannah. Thanks for sharing your story, Smarty. Um, hi, my name is uh, Hannah, and uh, <laughs> it's really hard to uh, think of uh, things I want to uh, say about myself within this uh, short time, but I was born and raised in South Korea, and um, I think it's natural uh, for people, maybe some people to wonder uh, how I came, ended up in the United States, and I actually came here uh, because of a guy I met in college 
So uh, I was going to Chongyin University, which is actually quite well known university university in Seoul, South Korea. Oh, maybe you can hear me very well. There you go. <laughs> um, all right. Anyway, so yes. Yeah, so maybe was, start. Sorry, Hannah. Maybe start at the beginning because it was hard to hear you. Right. Sorry about that. I, no problem. Uh, <laughs> I knew it somehow. Okay. Um, so I was born and raised in South Korea. And I came here after I met uh, my ex-husband while I was going to college. Um, so, you know, often people ask me, where are you from, where I'm from, uh, which is completely, I think, a legitimate question. I mean, I guess I would be wondering, curious, if I see someone that looks different than how I look uh, in my country. Uh, but often then that leads to a question of, uh, you know, how did you end up here? And in my case, actually, um, because I am not married anymore, um, it's been really difficult to uh, answer that question because I still feel quite vulnerable about my divorce, yet that becomes a part of, maybe that often becomes the very first conversation I have with people. Um, but anyway, um, so when I first came here, um, it was a shock to my family. Uh, my, at that time, my parents were both living in South Korea and see their daughter is from small town and neither of them went to college and was doing really well, went to a very well-known university all the way in Seoul. And I think uh, especially my mom who pretty much raised me and my brother without uh, help from my father uh, probably had a lot of hopes and dreams for me um, and then here I am so young like barely 20 years old and wanting to marry an American guy and move to all the way to America and that was very hard for my family yet I was just young and in love and I came here and then um, I, at the time because my ex-husband was going to college and I, I, I just graduated um, you know, I, I needed a job and I understood as a foreigner whose English is the second language, I didn't have any professional experience, uh, just a bachelor's degree from my college in Seoul. And I knew it would be very difficult to get a job. And, but, you know, I really tried my best. I went to every staffing agencies in, in Rochester and I will just do anything they might give me. Uh, and luckily I got a job that was supposed to last only three days or so, but I, um, I really you know, went and beyond and I actually got offered a full-time job from just that opportunity. And it was just really hard to get it started. But once I got my foot in the door, oh, there was a legal sector, by the way, I was a paralegal at a law firm. Um, you know, I was able to keep pursuing other career and I ended up having a quite fulfilling career at the American Red Cross. I started as a, a admin assistant and when I left that job, I was a program manager and I also ended up working at a local technology company. And I don't, you know, was having a quite fulfilling life um, here in so far from home. But um you, you know, it's not like I was living my dream, though. It, the job was uh, uh, because I needed to have a job, but I was very fortunate to have a good job, and I always work with, you know, work very well with people. But after my mom uh, passed uh, in 2017, I went into a really big depression, and I, at that moment, I was already playing music on the side, but that was kind of the, the turning point where I wanted to leave my uh, career when I was doing really great it, instead of maybe leaving when I can't handle it because I really was having a hard time. And then uh, I thought, okay, I was doing music for a while. Maybe this is a good time that I could pursue music as a full time, which I never dreamed though, because I felt that I had to have a certain level of uh, financial stability in order to, um, you know, uh, 
be okay, really. I didn't really have anybody to fall back on. But because now mom's gone and I just felt like I could maybe go for it. So it, for different reasons, I, I started just pursuing music as a full-time career since then. And, uh, you know, to my surprise, you know, I was able to just pay my bills and really started finding a lot of happiness. Um, and I really do feel like I am doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And I make so much less than I used to, but I've been very happy for about it. Uh, and, you know, interestingly, often if I say I'm a musician and people very, very often ask me, oh, are you an Eastman student? But actually, um, I never really got to go to music school like that. I wish I did. Uh, but, you know, my family growing up really, I mean, you know, I pretty much grew up under single mom situation and I never really could dream of uh, going to school for music and things like that. But I also, I love blues and jazz. So I, I learned a lot of those music just on the road at the, at, you know, just by going out and playing with other great musicians. And, um, and somehow I've been always so accepted, uh, which is why somehow I still live in Rochester, New York. And um, so I guess uh, sometimes people are surprised by even the fact that I play the blues uh, but, you know, there's probably a whole lot more stories that I can tell you why I ended up loving the blues, but maybe that has to be uh, some other time. But, um, uh, you know, so for me personally, because I'm in music and art, I've been very uh, fortunate to have people that I think have maybe more imaginative mind or more openness uh, and even people that love uh, jazz and blues, I often find them to be very open-minded. Um, so I think I've been, I had happened to be in that community very often that I personally haven't experienced a lot of racism uh, myself. But um, I know from, from recent events, it, it was hard not to think about, especially even those uh, Asians that were born and raised in the United States, who, you know, will be just as American as the next person uh, to feel this threat. And maybe, you know, even I sometimes now, I feel like I could be walking down the street and maybe just because of the way I look, I could be suddenly attacked. It's a, it's, it's a really, yeah, I think I, I lost some sleep on that thought for sure. But um, so I do appreciate, uh, you know, the, this today's session and for you to join because you want to understand more and you want to be the positive force in the community. And I really appreciate that. And um, if you do have any questions about me, I'm always open. So I hope you find a way to find me. Uh, it's not that difficult to find me. So I hope you keep in touch, but I will, I will pass it on to Frank. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you, the Levine Center and Samiha for being such a, a good host. And, and thank you, Hannah and Smirti, for, for sharing some really, really inspirational stories. I mean, I'm, I'm very inspired just sharing about what you guys have gone through and, and the, the paths that you guys have taken, which are extremely different paths. Um, again, my name is Frank Keo Fitlasi. I am a Monroe County legislator uh, representing District 28 in Northwest Rochester, where I'm very proud to say I was born, raised, and still live at, to this day. My story is a little different from the other two, and, but my story begins with my parents. Uh, my mom and dad are Laotian refugees. They came to the United States from Laos in 1980. They came here with nothing but the clothes on their backs. Um, a little background on what made them come here and, and why from Laos to here. Um, during the Vietnam War, Laos was the most heavily bombed country in history. They dropped millions and millions of tons of bombs in Laos. And even to this day, there are still millions of tons of de undetonated bombs in Laos. So um, my parents came here fleeing basically for their lives. And, and in Laos, they didn't even know each other. 
they met each other on their way here to the to the United States when they got married and um they ended up giving a chance for me and my my two older brothers I'm, I'm the youngest of the three uh my oldest brother because of my parents he uh fought for the United States during the Iraq war my middle brother is a union federal worker now and just 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 all the adversity that my mom and dad have gone through has given me and both of my brothers a chance. And it's, it's, it's truly inspiring because I don't, I don't think I would ever be able to handle a situation like that. Um, when I was a little younger in high school, I came up with the decision that I wanted to get involved in politics. I wanted to give back and I wanted to do good for this community, especially the community that, that raised me and the community that I know to the best of my knowledge. Um, my parents, uh, as most, probably most AAPI parents would feel, uh, they, they, weren't, they weren't big fans of politics. They, they honestly probably didn't think I really had a chance or a place in politics. My parents kind of fell into that, oh, you should go to school, maybe become a doctor, maybe do something, something like that. And that has never deterred me. But of course, my parents were always, always, supportive of me. My path in politics has been been pretty pretty crazy to say the least. Um, once I finished up MCC and got my associate's degree, I went to Brockport and in Brockport I took an internship in the state assembly where I ultimately met my uh, my former boss and my mentor, the late Assemblyman David Gant, who recently passed away. But through that I was given opportunities and after graduating, I, I didn't really know what I was going to do. I, I didn't know how to get involved in politics. So I started campaigning for various candidates throughout the city. And next thing you know, a month later, I get a call from somebody again. Hey, Frank, I want to I wanna, I wanna hire you. I want to give you a chance. And from there, I learned everything I need to know about politics. I started working my district. I started getting to know my neighbors even more. When I would see um, some of my friends growing up, I would go to their mom and dad's house and they'd be like, hey, Frank, I'm so-and-so's mom. You remember me? And that just made me feel so good knowing I can get involved with the people that, that kind of watched me grow. Um, as I continued working my district in 2019, I decided, let's, let's take a chance. And when I told my parents, they were like, what? You're, you're running for office? What does that even mean? I think even to this day, until until my, my win in 2019, my parents did not understand what I was really doing, but I know I, they couldn't be more proud of me. Um, in 2019, when I was elected, I, I became the first Asian American elected official in Monroe County. And unless I'm wrong now, I'm still currently the youngest elected official in Monroe County at 27. And Despite all of that, despite my parents not being a fan of politics, I always like to make the joke with them that I'm, I'm still here doing politics at the end of the day because of you guys. Their drive, their humility, everything that they did, all the circumstances they went through and just wanted to do right, wanting to give back for all they do, giving back to the community and give back back home in Laos. That's really what drove me to politics in a way. I just wanted to be like my parents for, for the area that helped raise me. And to be able to do this and inspire has just really, really been a dream. And I will now happily turn it back over just to Mia for any questions. Thank you again for giving me this opportunity. All right, thank you, Frank. I want to take this time to thank all the panelists once again for joining us and taking time out of their really busy days, especially Frank, who is joining us from his best friend's baby shower in his car, taking some time out from this very special occasion to be here. Um, I really appreciate all of your stories a little bit more. I felt like as a Bengali American and as a second generation immigrant, I could definitely relate to a lot of your stories, um, especially like Smirti, when she was talking about like the first thing you're asked on the job is where you're from. And you have to, instead of talking about your qualifications or actually getting done what you're hired to do, you have to spend 
10 to 15 minutes explaining the history of your immigration, which happened to me a lot during my college interview process. So going off of that, um, my first question for the panelists, for each, and each of you can go one by one, starting with Smriti, um, or you can chime in as you see fit. What assumptions have you faced since coming to the United States and how did you manage or face those expectations? Uh, like I said, uh, it was assumed that I didn't speak English uh, or didn't know how to write in English. Like it was uh, something that was extraordinary. Um, or like, you know, it's a story I've written about. Uh, my first trip to Wegmans, I had a pack of ground turkey on the on the belt, uh, whatever that belt is called. You know, I was getting to checking out, and uh, a lady behind me, I didn't know her, uh, asked me if my mother knew I was eating that, um, and I remember feeling this wash of fear, and then saying, "Oh, well, that's silly. Why should I be afraid? Uh, it's okay." <laughs> I eat meat. Uh, but, you know, sort of navigating those expectations, you're sort of expected to have an answer, some kind of answer that is sort of lands perfectly. I think that, um, or lands uh, in a way that doesn't cause any ripples. And I was always focused on that. And I think that sort of added some stress, uh, maybe in the beginning, but now I'm skilled at it. Oh, I guess I'll go. <laughs> uh, there's so many, but um, I, I remember a few times they people might think that um, you know Korean lady might be really good at cooking and very you know homey. Like I I love cooking and feeding people and you know a lot of those very typical uh, feminine expectations are highly get put on Asian women. I think. But I mean, in some way, it's true. I know a lot of other Korean uh, women that love cooking, but my, me, myself, I actually, I really can't care less. <laughs> that, which is why I love people who cook. I, I love them. I worship them. <laughs> and another thing is, I think because so many people, it's really lack of knowledge than anything that they might have seen a little scene on TV of some Asian country. And that is what they know about all Asian countries. Uh, and along with maybe some of the older people who've been to Korea a long time ago, maybe before I was even born, remember Korea a certain way. And then so they still kind of imagine country to be that way and don't realize Korea has been really developed. And in fact, most of the areas in Korea will be much more developed than even Rochester. Uh, I remember someone asking me, oh, so people in Korea ride bicycles a lot or like something like that. And I kind of know why he asked that and probably he's thinking of some other country. Um, and that kind of thing uh, happened a lot. And really often I, under I, I get to see a lack of just simply knowledge about different geography, uh, mm -hmm. how, you know, what areas, you know, Sometimes people will even confuse about North and South Korea, uh, which also surprises me. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of it's coming from just not knowing. So again, my, my story is a little different because I, I, was, I was born in the United States, but I still, I would say I absolutely still go through very, very similar assumptions and prejudices. And just because of the way I look, and um, for me, something that really I'm really proud of it when I look back is that, believe it or not, my favorite sport is is basketball. I love basketball. I love playing it. I love watching it. Um, back back in high school when I was at Wilson, Wilson is a predominantly African American school, but um, for me, I was probably the only Asian basketball player in Section Five at the time. Back from 2008 to 2011, I played from freshman through varsity. But assumptions like that, that, that I, I think um, you, just, you just kind of assimilate with what's around you and you enjoy what's around you. You kind of, you kind of prove people wrong. People, people make the assumptions about you all the time. So it's, it's really, um, it's really just, just going through and being yourself and being proud of being yourself for all the assumptions and 
I, I went through all the, the racial slurs, you know, kids uh, pulling their eyes back. And that's all typical stuff. You kind of try and take it on the chin or you address it and let them know that, hey, that's offensive. But um, so, yeah, again, my story is a little different, but it's still very similar to the, to the sense that I, I, I grew up in, in a culture that I kind of was, was thrown into. I didn't have a culture that I could compare it to, but I still went through it and, and kind of assimilated through it all. Thank you, guys. Um, a great question came up in the chat uh, for Frank, actually. So as a politician and as anyone else can relate to this or share their experience, how do we as a country deal with Asian hate? I can go first and see the director for me, but I, I think we deal with it by, by doing things like this, just getting, getting our message out and letting people, giving people a chance to actually get to know us. All three of us have taken three very, very different paths, and we, um, we've accomplished a lot through those various different paths. It's just getting that message out and getting to know the community. I think for me, especially in politics, just being able to get around and talk to the diverse neighborhoods that I represent, people, when you go to a door and you talk to people, they don't, they don't question who I am because of my race. They just like to, to get a chance to know you. And, and I think just getting the message out and combating it in that way and, and showing people that we're, we come, we're so different, but, but different in a good way, just like any other American person would be. Everybody is different, but I guess we're all so different that that still makes us the same. And um, funny like that, to, to let the next person know that we're, we're really all the same is, is the best way. And then the, the, I think the further on, the more barriers that are breaking down, the more all of us come together. Unity is really what we should strive for. And, and teaching that unity is what's important. I agree. I think that, um you know, letting more people know about us or being out and so that people understand that while they may not directly relate to our experiences, they see the humanity in it. And I feel like at the end of the day, we're all human. We hurt the same way. Um, and if I feel getting to know, being, telling people where we're from or others wanting to know more, educating them, and just knowing we are part of the community, community as much as they are. You know how to fix it, but see, I, I believe that no single issue is a single issue. You know, obviously we are dealing with Asian hate crime and, you know, the Black Lives Matter and there are all this stuff going on, but I, you know, I was trying to think about where, you know, these people come from, you know, hate crime. And I do feel like so many people have so many anger, so much anger right now, and people are so not satisfied with their life. And then all these people are giving misconception and wrong information into those people's head so that uh, they, are, they have something to blame on. Uh, and then now, you know, COVID blame on Chinese or every Asian, uh, you know, things like that. So... I think all the issues are in a way very, very closely needed. You know, people always feel like, you know, my, you know, I want to be selfish, but it seems like these people are taking what's from what's mm -hmm. mine. And, you know, that creates this racism too, on top of just simply not, you know, knowing, but then you know, it has to do with education too, because education is getting more and more ignored in this country and that people are not getting even a, you know, basic level of education about, you know, different country and history, not only American history, but world history. <laughs> so I mean, I can go on for like hours of why, you know, why things are the way thing, things are. So really, to me personally, no matter how difficult it is, I really try not to be hateful myself towards those people. And I really try to hold on to the idea of love. Like even if someone, it, maybe my, I mean, actually I got a rock thrown in me recently. Um, and I, the first thought that came to my mind was like, I wonder what was wrong with him. He was a younger kid, you know, teenager. So, you know, I, I was actually worrying about him. Like what makes him that way? You know, so, you know, you are obviously watching us out there because you care. 
And when you care, please be as, you know, loving and positive as you can, because you are already trying to do so much. And I, I want to give attention to the positive messages instead of negative messages. You know, sometimes I just don't even want to hear about it because I don't want to give somebody a satisfaction on my ears. <laughs> so, um, you know, let's, let's amplify the positive voices. And so that we can somehow over, you know, overshadow, or it's more like a over, you know, just make those shadow go away by make the make, make the positive voices bigger. I think that's the only thing we can do. But really, always, you know, I think we have to be very mindful of every single issues going on in the society. Unfortunately, no matter how tiring it is, because I think it's all <laughs> all related. Yeah, I definitely agree. As a political science student, I definitely feel like one of the biggest ways to address Asian hate is to learn a little bit about the history of colonialism because Sinophobia domestically kind of justifies imperialism abroad and that's how it always has been. It's what we view the, this country has used to justify wars and bombings and numerous atrocities. So I think filtering your news and being a little bit more conscious of especially during the coronavirus when all of these hate crimes started rising, it's important to learn about the negative effect that can have on a systemic level. Um, as well as with the model minority myth, I feel like that seeks to kind of divide Asian Americans as like separate or unique from other people of color when the case really is we're all being oppressed by white supremacy and we should see each other as allies as opposed to, you know, two people who are suffering from two different things in different ways. So kind of related to that, we got a question in the chat for Hannah. Um, how did you learn about the Black experience, culture, and culture through blues music? Me, uh, it, it didn't, I studied in back in Korea, my dad liked the music that was influenced by the blues. I wouldn't really call it as a straight up blues, uh, like a hard rock stuff, right? Uh, Led Zeppelin maybe, uh, and Beatles. I think Beatles was very influenced by, um, that too. And actually, you know, all the popular music in the modern history in the world, I think in one way or the other, been influenced by black music. And that's just it. And, but I didn't know where that sound came from. So for me personally, the sound caught me first. And then after I came to the United States, I learned more about it by running into those people that were playing the real blues, like Mr. John Cole, uh, Joe Beard and Joe Beard, you know, I don't know if you know him, but he's still around and he still plays. And so then because of those interests that I start, uh, started having from just the sound, it sounded good to me. It made me feel good. good. Then I learned, try to learn more about it. I read a lot of books. I try to uh, listen to the stories of, by those people or just even simply being around the people I think just over time, I got to learn like more and more about the entire picture, not just the sound. And, uh, and then the more I learned, the, the deeper my love became for that music too. And then that just naturally made me also care more about the people too. Uh, so that's, that's kind of how, I, and I'm still trying to learn, but I've been very fortunate to know, get to know people like John Cole and Joe Beer. Um, so this next question is for everyone. So how has your Asian American identity led to or influenced the work that you do today? And what advice might you have for young Asian American students who are pursuing a non-traditional field? Anyone can go. I, I, I go first. Um, I think, um, well, first to answer the second part, I think whatever it is you want to do you you got to go for it I, I think you just you just have to go for it it's, there's um it's it's so it's 2021 and it's, it's crazy to know that there's still still so many barriers to be breaking down broken down for asian americans and and any other ethnicity or or, or race or whoever it is it just you got to go for it and, and work for it i think i think there's some truth to that where if you work for it and it's something you're passionate about you can really accomplish it. I think my Asian identity um, helped me do that because, again, I, I tie it back to what I learned from my parents and just that perseverance through it all and the compassion that they've given me 
it, I, it's something that they put right into me and passed right down to me. And I think that's what, what makes me want to do what I'm doing. It's, it's, it's the experiences that they've gone through and the knowledge and the humility that they've instilled in me that makes me want to give back, makes me want to do, makes me want to teach anybody in this community that. Like, I'm, I'm just, at the end of the day, I'm still just a regular rough and tough kid from the Northwest streets of Rochester. And anybody, Asian or not, should pursue what their passion is about, especially for Asians, because there's always that that traditional you should you should be doing science, technology, or math or whatever it is. Don't don't let that deter you from really pursuing what you want what you want to do, what you're passionate about. Because at the end of the day, the most important thing is doing what you're really passionate about and, and loving what you do. And for me, I can I can say that right. I think I relate to a lot of what uh, Frank just said. Um, my parents taught me to learn um, and that you could learn anything. Um, and, and I think that kept my mind really open. And just the fact that I grew up with different cultures around me uh, kept my mind open. And that's how, what informs what I do today. Um, for Young, for the younger generation who's uh, seeking to do something off the beaten path, I say go for it. I did it and I did it in India, which is so much harder than doing it here. Uh, you know, writing uh, was considered a hobby. Um, so I think that yes, you can do it. You can do anything if you put your mind to it. And if your mind is open and, and organizations, uh, learning environments will welcome your voice. Yeah, I feel pretty much uh, similar to that too. Um, so my, you know, my, I, the way I want to uh, contribute my little uh, thing is just really, I, I'm lucky to be doing arts because just, you know, if I do my best to be a best musician, uh, that alone is my role. <laughs> but um, as far as, you know, the, to the young, other young Asian, uh, young people out there uh i would just say yeah you know just i i think you have to be yourself you have to be true to yourself whether you're a musician or you're a like admin assistant at a company because even for me like when i had uh my first job my korean accent was even like probably that much harder to understand for people or something but i um i still remember i used to say spreadsheet as a spreadsheet because <laughs> i didn't know a difference between long e and short e apparently the thing is my job wasn't doing a public speech at my at that particular role so even though i would say spreadsheet as a spreadsheet they still gave me a raise before doing a good job <laughs> on making that spreadsheet <laughs> so i think you know the you just you just do the best you can genuinely though you know be yourself and do the best you can i think um you have more people than you realize around mm -hmm. you that are already seeing the full value in you uh, beyond the color of your skin uh, beyond the accents you might have uh, so I, I still want to believe in people, but it's hard to change the world, but it might not be that hard to change the mind of someone already very close to you. And I think change starts from that. Um, so yeah, I think everybody just have to be themselves for sure. And that's really, I think, what makes America great um, and all these different values and ideas coming together. Going off of that same stem of how to change people's minds, I definitely think it goes off of a cultural change over generations. And so going off, so with that, um, what are your thoughts on how to address um, issues of racial differences and equity and inclusion within you, with youth and in the school systems? Well, that's a really easy question, Samia. Uh, <laughs> uh, I would say that we need to start young. And it's so true that we have to start early. We owe it to uh, our children in schools. Children need to know that and have an appreciation for cultures of 
within the US, outside the US, skin tones that are different, um, and, and, and build that sort of uh, understanding and empathy towards that, like, uh, and not paint a classmate as different. And even if there is, of course, situations arise, children, uh, you know, are curious, uh, and they want to know answers. And um, it doesn't come from a malicious intent at a very young age, but that's when we teach them. We teach them tolerance. We teach them equity. We teach them to be better citizens. And hopefully, we'll get to the point, hopefully, uh, of racial equity. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. You start young. I think um I think that's where it helped me is I started young in a, in a very diverse area and, and I think the more diverse you see or the more you teach the, the better people just genuinely are and I think um I think starting young and attacking and, and teaching teaching diversity is important I think educating whether it be through your teachers or from your parents or however you want to do it within the school system I think educating is educating diversity is important and, and knowing that at the end of the day, understanding that we are all human, regardless of what we look like. I think that's, that's something that people may think is common sense, but it, it's sometimes it's really not. So I think, I think making it intentional and, and, and making an effort to, to do it intentionally is, is one of the most important things. I don't think we're ever really taught anything like that growing up, at least not for me. It's almost an assumed thing, but I think it's important that we, we show people that it's not it's not something that everybody knows or something that's where and that, that can work on both sides. I um actually did some work at a school uh, before COVID as like a classroom aide and I just to kind of have a job on the side. So I got to work at an American school K one through six. And because I didn't go to school here. Uh, by working there, it was a really real culture shock. They were mostly city schools or uh, charter schools, and it was so different from schools that I grew up with, where kids listen to teachers and there are actually a lot of learning happen. It was quite shocking, and I also see that how, you know I thought you know what I was making for that job really wasn't that much for how much it involves. I mean, from sometimes six thirty a.m. till. 4.30, like almost no time to rest. And I really fell for teachers in America. And, and then the school itself, I really could, so, you know, we all care about education, but in order to care, they need more resources. And I think it's easy to think that, well, you know, I'm good and my kids can go to better school and there's, there's someone else's kids. But thing is, if, whether we want it or not, those kids are going to grow up and going to become part of the community that our, maybe your kids are going to live in. And really, unless you're actually going to build a wall and never see each other, we affect each other. So it really all benefits all of us. The more kids are grow up with better education. So even though sometimes I, I know it's easy to say, oh, but well, it's, you know, parents have to do the work too, but well, we have to do what we can as a society too. But I really do find that city school can use much more resources in general. Um, I really, I think, you know, all the money we can spend for something else, I am all, all about uh, more, we need more for education. And this will conclude the Q&A portion of our program. Thank you so much to everyone in the chat for sending questions. And most of all, thank you to our panelists, Smirti, Hannah, and Frank for sharing their personal experiences with us. And next up, I would like to ask Hannah by popular request to play a song that she wrote um, called Soyo Arirang. Okay. Uh, all right, well, so um, this song, let's see. I wrote this right when uh, the COVID lockdown first happened around last spring. Um, actually, my grandparents live in the States and my grandfather actually passed. But at the time, my grandfather was still living and he wanted to go to Korea. Prob he probably knew it was going to be the last time. But because of the pandemic, he actually couldn't go. And I was, uh, I was, I, and I ended up writing this song thinking about not only 
my reminiscing of Korea and how much I want to visit, how much he would want to visit. And, um, and I, it's called Soyo Arirang. Soyo is the name of the mountain that I grew up in my town. And Arirang is actually a, a form of traditional song in Korea. And we have a lot of different arirangs depending on the region. So, and it goes back many, many hundred years sometimes. Very, it goes back quite a bit. So I thought I'll make my own arirang. So it's no, it doesn't really sound like real Korean traditional song, but you, the motif is there. Um, so I hope you like the song. Um, and, you know, I guess uh, the whole time during COVID, I think something maybe you can relate to because we all uh, sat here and reminisced, uh, you know, something we yearning for.
Hannah, I, I don't even know how to thank you. That was just gorgeous. Thank you so very much. Really, really. What a beautiful ending. Thank you. All musicians love the opportunity to share their music. Well, I appreciate you doing it and we will find other opportunities to have you. And I hope sooner rather than later in person, and we'll be sure to share information about how people can find you uh, after this. So I just want to, I want to thank the nearly 100 people that joined us this evening. Thank you to our presenters, Mirti Jacob, Frank Kofit Latsi, Hannah Piquet, for sharing their stories and perspectives and opening the world a bit more for us. Thank you to Samiha Islam for her service on the Levin Center Steering Committee and for her superb moderating of today's program. We're grateful for the dedication of our entire steering committee, the generous funding uh, from the William and Mildred Levine Foundation and the support of the Jewish Federation of Greater Rochester. So you will get a survey as soon as, you, uh, as this ends. Please complete the survey for us. It will help us have the feedback we need to develop responsive and relevant programming. And please be sure to join us for the third and last session of the, our series of the Asian Matters series, Sunday, May 2nd at 7 p.m., when we will hear from three local Asian American change makers. Today's program was recorded and it will be sent out to everybody that registered. We'll also post the recording on our website, uh, endhaterock.org. That's endhateroc.org. And lastly, keep an eye out for additional resources from the Levine Center at End Hate that you can use to continue your learning and stand up for our Asian American and Pacific Islander communities. And with that, thank you all so much and have a safe and enjoyable evening.